Revelation chapter 9, if you would, please. Uh, you know what? In all the melee last night, I didn't look to see if we were uh, done with uh, chapter 8, but I'm going to I'm going to assume we were, yeah. Um, chapter 9 then. Um, the electricity went off at probably the worst time for me on Saturday. Is um, Of course, I, I was, I was um, rendering down two videos from Kenya while that, uh, while that storm came through. And of course, it shut my computer off. And so I'm going to have to wait till we get electricity again, start the computer up again, start the rendering process all over again so we can have some videos to post this week. Um, so it messed that up. And then it uh, kind of got in the way of, of how I put my sermons together. And um, my study for Sunday... Uh, you develop habits early on, and it goes all the way back, Brother George, to when uh, I took my first church out here at Richwoods, and it was a part-time church, and so I had to work during the week, and on weekends I would spend time visiting whatnot with people and spend time studying, and I got into a habit of studying this Sunday morning sermon, usually Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening, and it's been that way ever since. And so last night I had several things <clears throat> on my mind um, and was ready to start committing that uh, to my notes and so on. And then the storm came through, knocked our power out. And so uh, I think about 1.30 or 2 o'clock last night uh, is when I put this morning's message together. Um, because I was up, you know, waiting to see if the power would come back on and so on. And I uh, didn't feel very good last night anyway. So about, about 1.30 in the morning is when I finally got it together. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see if I spelled everything right. Uh, by the way, I, I worked on my tablet, which has a battery on it, so I was able to at least do that much. Revelation chapter 9 then, uh, the fifth angel sounded. Now, there's a lot, <clears throat> I'm going to spend a lot of time on this, um, more than usual. Um, I will probably spend, I, I won't say how much, um, but there's a lot here. This seems to be a very significant point um, in the trumpet prophecies. It's sort of like a, um, a change in patterns or a change in what God is doing. And that is, that is in the scriptures. If you look at verse uh, 13 of chapter 8, the last verse of chapter 8, you'll see a transition into chapter 9. And, be, and I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. So, here we have an angel actually coming out and announcing. Uh, if you think, whoa, whoa, whoa was bad, or whoa, 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 whoa was bad, wait till whoa, whoa, whoa. It's going to be really bad. And with what I uh, can see and find in the scriptures and connect to Revelation 9, uh, this is going to be a world-altering event. And that fifth trumpet, world-altering event. And we're, well, I, I don't ever talk about times, seasons, dates, years, and so on. Uh, it's something that God took out of me years ago, and I just haven't done it. Um, but I'll say this. We're on, we're on the verge right now, right now, of world-changing world-altering technology. Everything changes. The artificial intelligence that you can tap into on the internet probably pales in comparison 
to the AIs that are in laboratories, MIT, um, Caltech, China, Russia, you name it. Uh, what would China do with artificial intelligence? What would be their primary goal? Build an army. Okay, China is a hammer, and when it, when you're a hammer, everything in the world looks like a nail. And that's that's what they would do with it. They, they would figure out some way of winning every conceivable war. Remember what was said about the beast in Revelation 13. Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? And uh, I had the privilege of talking to two Korean War veterans Friday. And it was kind of funny because uh, there was probably 20 years between these guys, Chris. Uh, the first guy I sat down with, I was waiting for Lisa to check out. And I asked him, I said, did you serve your country? He said, yeah, Korea. And uh, he was a, um, a radio or a, a flight tower supervisor trying to keep the Russians on their side of the border. And uh, he said, "Those." He said, "We fought the Chinese already." And he said, "I didn't like it then." And then there was another guy that I'm not kidding you. He had, probably had 20 years on this guy. He was probably way up in his 90s. I figured him to be World War II, but he wasn't. <clears throat> but China would use artificial intelligence to create viruses, germs, um. Warfare like that, chemical warfare, biological warfare, they would use it to develop weapon systems, they would use it uh, for all kinds of things, and they would use it to guide those weapons. Um, so we're, we're entering into a time where it's not time to play around, it's not time to goof off, it's not time to, uh, to party and to celebrate, it's time to be so watch and be sober. Amen to that. Uh, but there's also... Technological advances, I've been talking about this for years in human genetics, but not just human genetics, every creature on the earth um, is at risk of a genetic transformation of some kind. Uh, because once scientists unlock a door and go in to see what's back there, they very seldom come out. They all, once you develop technology, you never undevelop it. And so we are progressing as a species to our own doom by playing God with DNA that we really don't know that much about. Not when, not when it all comes down to it. We don't know that much about it. The reason why I'm saying all this is that there does seem to be in Revelation chapter 9 at this fifth trumpet some form of genetic alteration taking place. So we'll get into that too. Let's read it again. The fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Now I have a theory about this star. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. We, I think we talked about that last Sunday. And he opened the bottomless pit. There arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth now these are not ordinary locusts these are not the ones that john the baptist ate in the wilderness these are not the locusts that uh blew through uh Turkana, kenya this past year twice uh these are devils these are evil spirits and we'll see that in a little bit um <clears throat> in verse three uh, you actually get a glimpse of that. There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth had power. Well, we're going to find out that these locusts have scorpion tails. This is an unusual thing. It's not normal. It's not what we see on this earth. We see scorpions, but we don't see them looking like locusts. We see locusts, but we don't see them having scorpion tails. Well, these have them. And so they are a different type of species altogether. Verse 4, and it was commanded them. Who commanded them? Who commands all of the spirits, both good and bad? Who commands them? God does. God is God. And if I didn't believe that, I, I, would, I don't think I'd make it. I'd fold up like a house of cards. I would just collapse if I didn't believe God was God and God was sovereign and God had all power in His hand. And that there is no God higher than our God. 
There is no God that can beat our God. There is no devil or devil force that can overtake and outdo God. And when God issues forth an order, a decree, a statute, or a judgment, it is done exactly the way God sent it forth to do. It does not fail. Amen. I'm preaching. We'll dismiss in a little bit. Amen. But uh, notice it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth. But that's what locusts do, isn't it? They'd eat the grass of the earth, but not these locusts. No, God's, God has commanded them against even their very nature. But they're not looking for grass. They're not looking for leaves on trees. They're not looking for any green thing, neither any tree. But only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now we've already seen that in Revelation 7. We have the 12 tribes with the seal of God in their foreheads. And remember the, the angel come out and he's, uh, he saw four angels standing at the four corners and they were about to release the winds and the angels said, no, you're not going to release them. Not until we have sealed the servants of God uh, in their foreheads. And th now, uh, think about this. There's a story in the Old Testament. You've already read this. You already know it. It's a particular event where a devil went through the Egyptians' towns and villages, the streets, and in the land of Goshen. And any house that was not signified by a certain thing, the firstborn in that house died. What was, what was that sign? It was the blood. Yes, it was. It was the blood on the doorpost and on the lintel. And it was commanded. The destroyer is the name of that angel, that devil. The destroyer, Abaddon, Apollyon. It was commanded the destroyer that he could not enter into any house wherein was the seal of God by way of the blood of the Lamb. Woo! I am preaching. Well, that's good. Amen. See, I've said this for years. Where you are responsible to be under authority and you abide under that authority, you also abide under protection of that authority. Am I right? If you, if you worked at a job and you follow the rules of that job and something goes wrong, whatever it is, and large, large sums of money are lost, um, or someone is injured, or God forbid somebody's killed. If you have followed the rules handed down to you, you, you personally are protected. Now the company, they may have to fork over something, but you personally are protected. But if in the investigation they find out that you were drunk, or you were asleep, or you were high, or you were that any number of things, or you were negligent in your job, or you went and took off for a while and came back and thought everything would be okay, but you were somehow negligent in your job and you stepped outside of the bounds of the authority where your job is, you are, you are going to be held liable for that. You personally are liable. You're guilty for causing whatever, whatever loss, financial loss, you're guilty of harm to somebody's person or the death of somebody. So where there is authority, there's protection. God And God illustrates this in Psalm 91. He that um, abideth in the secret place. Uh, he that... Oh, thank you, show off. I, it's one of mine too, but for some reason I can't get it started this morning. Probably because I was up at... 
2 o'clock. That, that doesn't qualify as being late last night. That qualifies as being early this morning. Yeah. Uh, where is that? Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. So when you put yourself under God's direct authority, you are also shielded by His protection. And He will not, it says, he, Surely He shall deliver, deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers. See, covering. You're covered. And under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. When you put yourself under the authority of the word of God, you are protected by that word. God's truth will be your shield and your buckler. And none of the fiery darts that the enemy sends your way will be able to reach you because you are covered by the protection of the word of God. And so here, those who have the seal of God, those who have submitted to God and to his authority, have the seal of God, thus they have the protection of God. And God commands these locusts with scorpion tails, mind you. These locusts are not going to uh, sting, nor stab, nor otherwise hurt anybody who is under the protection of Almighty God. They don't break the rules. There's not going to be one that gets away and sneaks around some other way and comes in the back way. No. God is a full service God. Amen. And he does not leave any chinks in the armor. He does not leave any uh, uh, holes or gaps in the walls. He protects totally, fully, and completely. So now, verse 5. And to them who, these locusts, was given that they should not kill them. This is interesting. But that they should be tormented five months. Now notice that here we have, uh, we're in the fifth trumpet. And the fifth trumpet sounds and we have in verse five, a torment season coming that lasts exactly five months. There's a reason why. God is establishing here, I, I do things in order. Find out what five means. Find out what I did in days of old with this number. Find out what I did and where this number shows up. And then you'll begin to see things that you never saw before. How many stones did David pick up? Yeah. And why does the Bible have to go out of its way to tell you that? Why, wouldn't it be okay to just say David picked up a handful of stones? No. He mentioned five for a reason. There's a reason for this. Um, when you study like the typology of the cross versus David and Goliath, you see that. Um, David is the shepherd uh, who's going out to fight the, the mighty uh, battle against the enemy, the enemy that shall be destroyed. Goliath represents death. And so David goes out and he defeats death uh, when he kills Goliath. But anyway, uh, they should be tormented five months and their torment was the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. So we have poison here. We have the injection of poison. We have um, man now. And here's something I'm, I'm picking up on I've never paid attention to before until right now. The rich man in Luke 16 said the same word in describing what he was going through when he was in hell for I am in torments or I am tormented in this flame so is there a connection could be because what we've had what we've got here realistically is the opening up of hell the gates of hell literally because out of hell immediately fire and smoke starts pouring up into the sky blocking out the sun and the moon and so you have hell literally unleashed and everything that was being held down in hell um, were these locusts with scorpion tails. And all of a sudden now they are released on the earth. You literally have hell on earth. And now you have everybody on earth, everybody on earth except those who are sealed, who are in torments. So can you imagine a time, five 
whole month. A hundred and fifty. Oh, I got to do this. Turn to Genesis. Turn to Genesis and I'll ramble while you turn. Five whole months. 150 days. Where people are in so much torment. They're weeping. Gnashing of teeth. In agony. Can you sleep when you're in great pain? Listen, people. It's wise to be afraid of hell. It's double wise to be afraid of this. I don't want nothing to do with it. Just reading that right there. It, I, I would say this. If hell was five months long, if this was hell and it was five months long, I wouldn't want that as my punishment. To be in torment five whole months is something that I don't think we're designed for in these bodies. That same exact time frame. I want you to look in uh, Genesis 7. Oh, let's see here. Yeah. Verse 23. And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive. And they that were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. That's five months. It's, a, it's the exact amount of time. And what did Jesus say? As it was in the days of Noah. And I think this is a connection to it. I really do. And, and I, can't, I can't bypass it, especially with uh, th other things I've seen in Scripture. And we'll get into that. But it, later on, I think in chapter 8, it says it again. Verse 3, the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the water were, were abated. It actually gives you the dates that on the 17th day of the second month, the flood waters began. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, was the waters fully abated and that was uh, 150 days so it gives you the exact dates for that event as well now uh, go back to Genesis 1 since you're in Genesis let's look at this pattern very quickly or very slowly let's look at it very slowly that way I have something to teach next week because you know I never know I may run out of stuff to talk about okay who left Who's giggling? My fifth grade teacher knew I wouldn't run out of stuff to talk about. My sixth grade teacher, Mr. Spiker, knew I wouldn't run out of stuff to talk about. Huh? Old Bulldog Spiker. Yep. Ralph. He used to tell Norwegian jokes because he was from Minnesota. He did. He's pretty funny. Yeah. yeah. That's all right. Anyway, so Genesis 120. This is, watch this. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly upon, above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Now, on day five of creation, that's what this is. God creates two things. The fowls of the heaven and the animals or the creatures that are in the deeps, the sea. A group of animals that are below us and a group of animals or beasts that are above us. See where I'm going with this? All on day five. And God, verse 21, created great whales. Think of a story. It has a whale in it. And every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. And they have. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Now, all of this connects to the fifth trumpet. It all does. Um, it, it even connects to the fifth seal. Because in the fifth seal, um, if we go back to Genesis 6, or Revelation 6, excuse me, 
When I, uh, verse 9, when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain. We have death here for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? White robes were given them, every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until the fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So in the fifth seal, opening of the fifth seal, you have death. You have murder. These people are killed. These witnesses of Jesus Christ are killed. Now, turn to Genesis 5. This is a pattern. I've talked about this several times, but even when you think that you've got something all figured out in the Bible, keep reading. Because you ain't, you, ain't you ain't got nothing yet. Okay? When I, when I look back at the years uh, and I see the zeal in me, but, yeah, the knowledge just wasn't there yet. Um, I, I thank God for it. I really do. Because somebody, somebody corrected me. Uh, I had written that the number five represented the, the rapture translation, and we'll see that. And so they said, Pastor Mike, would you look at something? I think the number five represents death. Will you at least take a look at that? And I'm going, no. <laughs> That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But then I thought, well, okay, I'll just, just to prove him wrong. Well, he was right. I mean, he was way right. So then I had to, I had to ask myself, Mike, what you were seeing with the number five, does that still match this idea that it's related to death. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, notice that in Genesis 5, verse 1, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And you'll see Adam mentioned in verse 1, and then Adam mentioned in verse 2, and male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Verse 3, and Adam lived 130 years. So that's the third time he's mentioned. Verse 4, in the days of Adam, that's the fourth time he's mentioned, after he had begotten Seth for 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. Verse 5, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So, fifth time he's mentioned. He's mentioned five times. He's not mentioned six times or seven times in this chapter. Five times, and he dies. Now look at Seth. Seth is first mentioned in verse 3, and he's mentioned once in verse 3. He's mentioned once in verse 4. He hath begotten Seth. In verse 5, he's not, well, he is mentioned. Verse 5, he's not mentioned. Verse 6, and Seth lived 105 years. Verse 7, Seth lived after he begat Enos, 807 years. Verse 8, and all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Seth is mentioned five times, and he dies. Same as Adam. And then you look at Canaan. Canaan's mentioned five times, he dies. Enos, Enos mentioned five times, and he died. And that pattern is repeated all throughout Genesis 5. It's only broken twice. The first time by uh, Enoch broke the pattern because Enoch didn't die, did he? He did not see death. He was translated into heaven without seeing death. So, and somebody else broke the pattern. Noah. Fifth time Noah's mentioned, it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen? That's how you escape death. Finding grace. And did Noah escape death? Yes. So this number five then, I like this. Here's the devil's lie. Ye shall not surely die. It's a lie, isn't it? Because anytime the devil says you're not going to die, you're going to die. I was I had a video yesterday I was looking at, and, it, and I've seen this before. It reminded me of seeing it back in the 80s. There was a magician that was trying to pull off a stunt whereby he was going to have himself buried in a big plexiglass coffin. He was going to try an escape routine. Uh, the guy before him barely made it out with his life that tried this. They lower the casket into the ground and they start pouring concrete right on top of it. How stupid do you have to be? Camera's rolling. The guy that did it first Barely escaped with his life. He had concrete all in his mouth. He barely got out. This guy never bothered to check the uh, 
ability of the coffin that he was in, never bothered to check how much concrete and how much weight that was going to be. And with the cameras rolling, they're filling this hole with concrete and all of a sudden you see the concrete level immediately lower by about 8, 10, 12 inches and a big bubble's coming up. He died instantly. Okay? What were you thinking? Apparently, he believed a lie. He believed that he could get out of it and everything would be... Oh, hush. He believed that everything would be okay. And isn't that true of everybody that dies without Jesus? They'll think, I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. I'm bulletproof. And the devil says, you shall not surely die. But that's a lie. And his lies always bring death. Amen. Father, bless your word. Uh, show us great and mighty things in it. Uh, even, Lord, with what little bit I gave out today. Lord, I pray, God, that your saints and people who just love your word everywhere, Lord, would just study and want to know more. So that we, as we walk in these days, Lord, lots of things can change very quickly and very rapidly in this world. We pray, God, your blessings and give us sight, give us faith, and give us protection, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.